tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Now is not the time to be talking about scaling back our, our plans to, to improve bus and, and transit service. As the transit dispute drags on, a union suggestion on how to meet wage demands is rejected by Metro mayors. Also, ruffled feathers. District of North Vancouver Council votes on banning the ownership of pigeons and... I was dumbfounded. I could not believe my eyes. A Chilliwack Seniors Home confines a 94-year-old blind woman to her bedbug-infested room for two weeks. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Metro Vancouver transit operators say they could be parking their buses later this week if they don't get a new deal. Contract negotiations have stalled and there are a growing number of calls to get the two sides back to the bargaining table. And as Leon Young reports tonight, comments by the region's mayors aren't sitting well with the union. It's a stalemate. More than 5,000 unionized workers on one side. For far too long, TransLink and Coast Mountain Bus Company has relied on a broken model. And Coast Mountain Bus Company on the other. In the middle of bargaining, the union walked away from the table. It's day four of job action. Bus drivers aren't in uniform and maintenance workers are refusing overtime, leading to six more C-bus cancellations and another voice chiming in. It is disappointing, though, uh, to hear uh, Unifor leadership suggest that, uh, that the wage increases be done uh, by scaling back the, the expansion plans that we do have uh, for, uh, for bus service in, in the region. As chair of the mayor's council, Jonathan Cote helps elect TransLink's board. His criticism of the union suggestion was countered. Well, rather than lecturing the workers who make the system run, I'd like to know what Coast Mountain Bus Company's plan is to end this. I'd like to know what TransLink's plan is to end this. And I'd like to know where the mayor's council stand, because we've been very clear. Unless these issues are addressed, this will escalate and it will end in a complete work stoppage. The union demands come at a cost, more than $600 million. With record ridership, Cote says tapping into money slated for the mayor-approved transit expansion plan is off the table. Now is not the time to be talking about scaling back our, our plans to, to improve bus and, and transit service. Coast Mountain Bus Company, a TransLink contractor, agrees it won't stop expansion, but won't say how it plans to close the gap between the two sides. But what I will say again, just to be clear, is that we're not finished bargaining. If a deal isn't reached soon, the union is considering escalating job action. For example, an overtime ban leading to a 10 to 15 percent overall reduction in bus service. And that means more disruptions. That could happen by mid to end of the week. What everyone does agree on, though, is that negotiations need to continue. But no dates have been planned yet. Leanne Young, CBC News, New Westminster. North Vancouver District Council is voting tonight on a new bylaw that would make it illegal to own pigeons. But the move is ruffling feathers because it targets the neighbor of someone on council. Municipal Affairs reporter Justin McElroy is here tonight. First of all, Justin, uh, tell us about the pigeons and who owns them. Yeah, Mike, this bylaw has been in place since 1971. And for the last 17 years, Cool Want Delay says that he's had pigeons, homing pigeons, that he's taken care of for in different homes in the district. But he says that three years ago, things changed. He moved to a new home, bought the house, and his next door neighbor, who is now a sitting councillor, immediately began complaining about the pigeons. Everybody hobbies. She have two dogs. I never complained. She always barking. She a backyard, no problem. I have backyard, and my pigeons always on my area. So I don't know why she's complaining for. So Justin, this is a district councillor that's complaining about this man's pigeons. Yeah, Betty Forbes is her name, and she's been complaining about this uh, basically ever since he moved in three years ago. Now, at first, she was just a member of the public, but she sent lots of letters to staff phone calls, and at one point in 2017, at a public hearing about chicken coops, she brought up the pigeon bylaw and how she wanted it repealed at that meeting, saying that uh, this pigeon, ever since that they had come in, was having an impact on her and her property values. I know this isn't a popular subject, or it sounds pretty uh, cold, but there is an impact to having coops in backyards to properties that are next door to that. Um, I've spoken with a couple of real estate agents and they tell me that will definitely have an effect. 
Now, Forbes has recused herself from the votes on this so far, declaring, of course, a conflict of interest. However, freedom of information documents given to CBC News show that she did email the counselor who has put forward this motion with the subject line talking about the pigeon bylaw several times before it was brought up earlier this year. Okay, so how are the rest of the council members responding? Well, last week, this went through first and second hearing, and it passed four votes to two. And so if all goes according to script tonight, that would be the normal vote here as well. But at least one of the councillors who voted no a week ago says that it is a little concerning to hear this information. He didn't want to speak publicly about this new information about the councillor's emails, but says given that everything that the district has on its plate and given that there's only one public complainant about the pigeons, it seems like a strange thing for them to focus on. I'll see what I, what I said before, which is that I don't think it's an appropriate use of our time, and there are uh, more important issues for our council to be discussing other than uh, banning pigeons based on a single complaint. So we'll see with this new information tonight if the rest of the council agrees or not. Yes, we'll see if it takes flight. Thanks, Justin. An Ontario woman is going public tonight after learning about how her elderly mother was treated at a nursing home in Chilliwack. Last December, the woman was confined to her room for two weeks, her mattress and sheets riddled with bed bugs. As the CBC's Erica Johnson explains, one advocate says the incident is part of a larger problem at for-profit senior homes. A bed bug outbreak, footage nervously taken last December by a nursing home worker. Inside the room, a Rita Bedford, 94 at the time and blind. A resident at the Cascades, owned by one of Canada's biggest nursing home chains, Sienna. Today is a new day. Bed bugs from a neighboring apartment had infested Bedford's room. Documents show management brought in pest control for next door, but not for Bedford's apartment bed bugs multiplied and management confined Bedford to her room for two weeks over Christmas. A worker sent the secret video to Bedford's daughter. I was dumbfounded. I could not believe my eyes. Another employee took pictures, emailed them to provincial health authorities, writing, please help these persons, it's inhumane. She alleged everyone was informed by management to lie. Since Bedford was blind, she couldn't see what was going on. I could not believe that a facility in Canada subsidized by the province would allow something so hideous to happen. BC's Ministry of Health investigated and found the nursing home was not in compliance with several regulations, including protecting residents from abuse and neglect. This lawyer is currently pursuing dozens of lawsuits against all three of Canada's biggest nursing home chains, Siena, Extendicare and Rivera, alleging neglect and abuse. I'm infuriated that we still are allowing these um, corporations to make money off our seniors and still allowing them to make that money while delivering shoddy care. The allegations against the big three chains haven't been proven in court. The companies say they don't have merit. And Erica Johnson from Go Public joins us now. So, Erica, what is Sienna Senior Living saying about the conditions that Rita Bedford was living in? Well, we asked the company for an interview and it declined. Instead, it sent us a statement saying that it apologizes for the overall experience and it admits that its actions should have been better. Uh, we did ask a couple of times why the decision was made to confine a 94-year-old woman to her room for more than two weeks, and we didn't get a response. Okay, so what uh, repercussions, if any, did the company face after the uh, incident first came to light? Well, uh, the, the BC government, the, the Ministry of Health, investigated and found the home was not in compliance with a number of regulations, including not protecting seniors from abuse and neglect, and not having sanitary conditions, and having insufficient staffing levels. So that was its finding in May. The province checked in again. In June, the chain was still not in compliance. And as recently as last week, we were told that the, the that home was still not complying with those regulations. Now, in BC, there are no fines when this happens, and so the, the government wouldn't respond when we said, what are the penalties? It appears they are just working with this home to get it up to compliance. 
All right, Erica Johnson from Go Public. Thanks. Thank you. Well, don't go viral, get your flu shot. That's the clever message from Fraser Health and Vancouver Coastal Health, reminding people to get vaccinated against the flu. Health authorities kicking off their annual flu campaign today. Flu shots recommended for everyone six months of age and older. They're also available free of cost to children between six months and five years old, seniors, pregnant women, indigenous people, and those with chronic health conditions. The intranasal flu vaccine, flu mist, is not available for use in Canada this season, meaning all vaccines will be given by injection. Flu shots are now available at your doctor's office, walk-in clinics, public health-led flu clinics, and urgent primary care centers. Every year, about 3,500 Canadians die from the flu. There is a renewed push to find money for a new ice arena in Cloverdale. A proposed $44 million project was shelved last year, but as the CBC's Jesse Johnston reports, hockey parents say the lack of ice time is so frustrating, some kids are quitting the sport altogether. Make sure that you're walking, looking, and you're taking that shot when you go. If you're a dad, and all three of your kids play hockey, you spend a lot of time at the rink. As we had with my uh, son's team, two uh, back-to-back mornings of 5.15 a.m. to 6.15 a.m. practices. He wouldn't mind the early mornings so much, but he also coaches his 16-year-old daughter's team, and she plays late at night. I think when we're trying to study for exams and then um, having to go to late night hockey, it's pretty hard. The city operates nine sheets of ice at five different arenas, up one sheet from last year. Many say that's not enough to accommodate all of Surrey's young athletes who need ice time. So parents are left to choose, put up with early mornings and late nights or find another sport. The numbers are dwindling and some of it has to do with the hours that parents just don't want to be, they don't want to be getting up at those hours, going to the rink with their kids. They don't want them to have to deal with the aftermath of being fatigued and tired. The city planned to address its ice shortage last year by building a new arena in Cloverdale. Despite community rallies, council postponed the project to save money. We need a new arena there, full stop. Um, I don't even think that's a question. But money in Surrey is tight these days. The policing budget will climb by about 11% as city replaces the RCMP with the municipal police force. And all current members of Mayor Doug McCallum's Safe Surrey Coalition, which holds the majority of votes on council, voted against the new arena last year. McCallum's team says no final decisions will be made before council hears from the community. We have to rely on what the people have to say. So. Uh, really, we got to wait till our, uh, the process plays itself out. Last year, the community fought for a new rink and it didn't work. This year, they'll try again. But when you're up this early, it's tough to fit organizing a rally into your schedule. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Surrey. Brett is here now. We certainly have had a great uh, stretch of weather, but a little bit uh, murky out there tonight. Yeah, murky, hazy, foggy, kind of using these terms interchangeably. We've had a lot of stagnant air, air that's essentially just gone straight to the surface and really hasn't had the chance to mix up. So with the combination of some fireworks over on Halloween um, and just in general, fine particulate matter, we're going to start to see a few of those fog patches carry on throughout the overnight and then maybe even last into tomorrow morning. Temperature-wise, though, our story is pretty straightforward forward here only looking at about six or seven degrees across much of the lower mainland a little warmer actually over toward Vancouver Island and that's all pretty well where we should be for this time of year there are just a few little patches of cloud or some fog here and there really it's going to be quite localized but I did want to show you that just to the other side of the Strait of Georgia here we are dealing with a special air quality statement that has been put in place by Environment Canada it's surrounding the community of Duncan so there is some restrictions in place about open burning but being on this side of Vancouver Island, that still should apply to anyone that is also on this side. I think that would make some sense. In terms of what we can be dealing with for our look ahead, though, you're going to notice that it really is going to come down to those foggy patches throughout the overnight tonight, maybe first thing tomorrow morning. In general, we're probably going to be seeing a more cloudy start to the day than we have for a little while. But by the afternoon, we're going to see that sun come back. Temperatures right around seasonal. And then come tomorrow night, well, it's going to be lather, rinse, repeat. We're going to be seeing this for the next 24 hours at least. All right, thanks. Brett, talk to you in a bit. Sounds good.
Oh, Canada's big city cemeteries are filling up, and that means there is a shrinking number of burial spots available for the estimated 7 million Canadians who will die in the next 25 years. That has officials looking for some creative solutions. CBC's Karen Pauls shares some groundbreaking ideas in Vancouver. Rena Lazar is preparing for the changing of the seasons. I think I'm going to cut the branches right back. As she prunes her plants, she also contemplates the changing seasons of life and death. I love cemeteries, so I definitely want to be buried. But her cemetery of choice is running out of room. What we're trying to figure out is how to optimize the use of that, that very limited capacity that we have remaining. Mountain View Cemetery is one of the only in Canada allowing families to reuse graves after 40 years, but there's only about five years worth of grave sites left. Historically, one grave would be sold to one person or one family. We now have permission explicitly within our bylaw to split those, that occupancy of that grave. The details are still being worked out, but it means more people can share rights to a site and more people can be buried there over time. Anyone opting in agrees to be buried in a shroud or biodegradable container, and it's only for new graves. No one already buried will be disturbed. We can't tell you exactly which grave we're going to assign you to, but we can at least assign you to a cluster of four or five. These are not mass graves. No, 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 no. These are not mass graves. These are, these are people who are agreeing and want to be buried in a grave that they're sharing space with someone else. These are columbaria. This cemetery planner says the lack of space is becoming a crisis across the country. Planners don't talk about cemeteries. Politicians won't talk about it. And most of us don't even want to consider the reality of our own mortality. Some say it's time to reactivate cemeteries like this one that have been closed for decades. This environmental planner says it's an issue of equity. Affordable housing is an issue and this is also an issue within the cemeteries. With her Jewish heritage, Rena Lazar is glad she can be buried at Mountain View Cemetery. I'm super happy to not have to go very far. <laughs> People will still have the option of traditional grave sites like this, but if they want something a little more green, a little less expensive, and they don't mind sharing space with strangers for their final resting place, shared grave sites will soon be an option here. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Vancouver. And a reminder, you can watch this newscast live on CBC GEM. The free app is also where you can find other CBC programs. And CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Coming up, staying and going. Elizabeth May will stay on as MP, but is quitting her job as Green Party leader. So who's replacing her? We're going to tell you after the break. Well, thanks for staying with us during the three-minute commercial break on television. Well, this weekend at the Woodward's building in Vancouver, volunteers were buzzing with preparations for a turkey fest, fixings and all. As Joel Ballard reports, it's an annual dinner that hopes to bring a post-Thanksgiving tradition to an area that's seen its share of struggles. The tables are set, the food cooked, and there's a long line of hungry dinner guests. Soon, more than 1,000 people from around the downtown east side are expected to fill this atrium for the 10th year of hot turkey dinners. There's definitely a need for it. You know, there's lots of hungry people and it's a really great opportunity to have everyone come together and do a community event that also helps out as well and provides a warm meal. And with the doors open, the seats are filling up. Among the crowd is 65-year-old Terry Olowinski. I came here to eat like everybody else. She says this meal is a chance to treat herself. Usually I do the cooking. This is her fourth year attending the dinner a tradition of sorts. It all stems from a commitment by the developers to build a relationship with the neighbourhood. Since the redevelopment of Woodward's, it's been very important to make sure that there's a sense of community. A touchy subject, as the area and those who live here try to cling to their identity amid the squeeze of gentrification. A neighbourhood that is home to some of the city's most vulnerable, while also boasting luxury condos. This dinner, an effort to bridge that gap. More than 100 volunteers are on hand. 
Cressman says they've added small touches, like china and silverware instead of paper plates, to provide a sense of dignity. Instead of just a buffet style, we're actually having it so the guests can sit down and be served directly. And those guests are eager to eat. I heard there's a meal here, so I don't have to go home and cook. I heard there's a big nice turkey dinner with everything, uh, drum, you know, chicken and uh, turkey, whatever, and pumpkin pie for dessert. As in past years, volunteers will continue to serve the food right through the evening until it's all gone. Very good. <laughs> which sounds just fine to the guests. Meet more after this, though. <laughs> Joel Ballard, CBC News, Vancouver. And stay with us. We're going to be back in just a few moments with the latest on Elizabeth May stepping down as leader of the federal Green Party. And we've got some incredible footage, drone footage to show you of the southern resident killer whale population. UBC researchers looking into that. All of that coming up in just a couple seconds. Elizabeth May has officially stepped down as leader of the Green Party of Canada. May made history as the first Green MP to be elected to the House of Commons back in 2011. Despite winning a record three seats last month, the Greens will not have much sway in this minority government. CBC's Salima Shivji has more on what's next for May and the Greens. An election result that Elizabeth May calls both a big success and the impetus for her to leave as leader on her terms. I want to choose my own time of going. I want to choose a time when we've done better than we've ever done before, with over one million votes. It's also a promise kept to her daughter, Kate. Mom, you just, you can work like harder than anybody's any, ever seen, but it's not good for you. May isn't going far, staying on as MP and her party's leader in the House. Hi, Elizabeth May. But her 13 years as head of the party, complete with victories like claiming a first seat, are now behind her. So is a federal campaign that, after provincial success, was seen as a great opportunity. The hope of capturing a dozen seats shattered. The party only managed three and failed to capitalize on a moment where May's central goal was also top of mind for voters. What you saw was a lot of bunching of progressive parties on the left talking about green issues, talking about climate action, but people did not see Elizabeth May as the path to actually achieving that climate action. There was praise today from political opponents, including one former Liberal. May tried unsuccessfully to woo to the Greens. Jody Wilson-Raybould applauding her friend for passion, determination and thoughtful advocacy. Praise also from fellow Greens when asked about the path forward for a new leader. Tenacity, bravery, um, the same qualities that I would use to describe Miss May. I really deeply admire her legacy. I mean, she's been a good friend of mine, a mentor, an inspiration. But also criticism from some with leadership ambitions. I think a lot of people are looking for uh, somebody a little bit younger, but that also has experience and is completely bilingual. And so begins a year-long search to fill a large void. Elizabeth May says she'll stay neutral. It's for Green Party members to choose their new champion next fall. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. And despite failing to take hold of the balance of power in Parliament, many political experts say May is leaving the Green Party on a high note. They grew their numbers. Over half a million more people voted Green in this election than in 2015. Uh, she's going to leave this... Uh, party in pretty solid shape and with hopes of perhaps further renewal and growth uh, on the East Coast. May will remain on as caucus leader and will continue to represent her riding of Saanich Gulf Islands. May also says she will run again in the next federal election. Deputy Leader Joanne Roberts has been named May's interim successor until a new leader is chosen next year. Eleven senators have broken away from their previous political affiliations in the Senate to form a small-c conservative-leaning caucus they call the Canadian Senators Group. 
The push for the creation of the new group came from an Alberta conservative senator and a liberal appointed independent BC senator. Both say the aim is to promote equal representation of all regions of Canada. The group of 11 is from eight provinces and is inviting other like-minded senators to join, but only to a limit of 25 members. The size of the group gives them access to funding for policy research and the right to seek committee seats as representatives of their new caucus. The majority of seats in the Senate are held by former liberals and conservatives who are now independent senators. Well, a group of Western separatists known as Wexit has applied to become a federal political party. Elections Canada confirming to CBC News it received the party's application today. Leader Peter Downing says his party's aim would be to bring more Western-focused MPs to Ottawa and that it would advocate for the unification of the four Western provinces and their eventual separation from Canada. The controversial group submitted more than 500 signatures with its application, more than double the required amount. After making sure the application is complete, Elections Canada will verify 250 signatures as required by the Elections Act. Whether the U.S. is still a safe country for asylum seekers is a key question being asked today in a Canadian courtroom. The answer could impact the safe third country agreement between the two countries. As Linda Ward explains, people seeking asylum must apply first in the country where they land. They are looking for a place where they can feel safe. These groups have gathered outside the federal court here in downtown Toronto to say that they believe that the United States is no longer a safe country for asylum seekers. They're protesting the safe third country agreement, which basically says that if asylum seekers land in the United States, they can't then uh, ask for asylum here in Canada. They have to ask for asylum in the first place where they arrive. Now, we have been speaking with some of the protesters here in line today, and Anne and you are, uh, you've come out here today. Why are you here? Um, we're here to protect the rights of refugees. You've been working with refugees, you said, for 31 years? Yes. yes. Why is this so important to you to get rid of this agreement? Um, because refugees need protection. And um, refugees coming to our borders, they often have very, very powerful refugee cases and they need to have the opportunity to have the protection of Canada. We made this banner and all the words on this banner are what we feel. We need to protect refugees at our border, and so we must uphold our laws and protect refugees. Thank you, Anne. And we also spoke with one of the main litigants in this case, the Canadian Council of Refugees. Here's what they told us about why they wanted to mount this challenge today. That agreement, initially penned in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 and implemented in 2004, creates a situation where refugees are being returned to situations of serious risk. Particular classes of vulnerable refugees in particular end up in detention, languishing there for uh, extraordinary, extraordinary periods of time in egregious conditions. And they're one of three advocacy groups that successfully challenged this back in 2007, but that was overturned on appeal because the court said that they had not heard from anyone who was directly affected. But in court today, we've been hearing the often harrowing stories of the litigants that have come forward in this case. Now, in the recent federal election, the Liberal said that they were going to try to modernize this pact but in the meantime this case will be before the courts here in Toronto all week we anticipate the ruling will take much longer than that Linda Ward CBC News Toronto some incredible images they're using drones to monitor orcas from above on the west coast so why are they doing it and what are they seeing that's next
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. The list that I saw last week was every single project that they had planned in the next number of years was somehow going to be impacted if they treated the drivers fairly. We just don't buy that. As job action continues and could escalate, Metro Vancouver mayors are wading into the transit dispute, rejecting a union suggestion to scale back planned bus expansions for the next decade to cover the cost of wage demands. Also, a District of North Vancouver Council voting tonight on banning the ownership of pigeons. But the only person who has them lives next door to a councillor who says it would affect her property values. I could not believe that a facility in Canada subsidized by the province would allow something so hideous to happen. A Chilliwack senior's home apologizes after confining a 94-year-old blind woman to her bed bug infested room for two weeks. Well, a team of UBC scientists studying the feeding behavior of killer whales has a whole lot of new information tonight by changing their perspective. Using drone cameras over a two-month period this summer, they got to see orcas feed on Chinook salmon, but also interact with each other in ways never seen before. Earlier today, I spoke with Andrew Trites, director of the Marine Mammal Research Unit at UBC for more. Andrew, you uh, certainly got some remarkable images from the drones, but uh, at this point, what have you learned about this endangered population? Well, it's interesting. We went out with a very specific question to determine whether or not southern residents can get enough fish to eat. And yet, with these images we caught, we saw more things than what we ever expected. And I think the most striking thing was to see just how tactile the animals were. They're constantly touching each other um, and staying in touch. And we saw them essentially using this drone like a, a fly on the wall, looking down at them in a way that we haven't truly appreciated, I think in the past. So for certain, a new perspective to, to watch them. What struck you the most? The very first evening, we left essentially downtown Vancouver, sailed out around the University of British Columbia, and encountered the southern residents who had not been around here for over two months. Um, and so we were seeing signs of fish being present, which was our central question. But we also got to observe uh, the animals interacting with each other in, in very social ways. Uh, one of the interesting things was to see um, a mother with her newborn calf. We had two new calves born this year, and this calf was to the J-pod. And I was really struck to see that this young female, only three months old, she drinks milk, but she was carrying a fish in her mouth. And uh, it just struck me, and it gets all of us on board uh, the research crews asking why. Is she teething, or does she just want to be like mom? Something you wouldn't necessarily see from the water. Yeah, and, and when we're on the water, and I've seen whales on the water going back to the 1980s, and certainly taking images and pictures with cameras, but we see them on this flat plain. And from up above, where we can look deep into the water, uh, we do see the same thing we see from above, so up to breathe, but once underwater, there's twisting and turning and rubbing. And it gets us thinking about how even us as humans, uh, we like to touch each other. We hug our kids, we hug our husbands or wives, uh, hug our friends, and, and it maintains social bonds. And to see this also occurring among the whales, um, I found uh, quite remarkable. And I know you're still looking at these images and, and working on the data. When might we see some results? Um, we're still processing. We collected a lot of images because in addition to watching the behavior of the whales, we were also taking images uh, and seeing below the water. Uh, to look at where the fish were, the depths, the numbers. And so we need to put all these data sets together and we're hoping to have some preliminary results to discuss and bring forward in the springtime. Well, we will certainly look forward to that. Andrew Trites from UBC, thanks for speaking with us. Thank you. Well, daylight coming an hour earlier today as we enter standard time. It might be darker every day, but there still has been quite a bit of sun around. Is there more to come? Brett has the full forecast coming next.
The air quality in one of the world's most polluted cities has become so poor, officials say it's like smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. Toxicity levels in New Delhi are more than 10 times higher than safety limits. As the CBC's Chris Brown reports, Indian officials are now taking unprecedented steps to try to protect human health. An enormous, putrid white cloud has enveloped New Delhi, causing people to wheeze and choke on air that could cause permanent lung damage. They get suffocating to breathe also sometimes and uh, like uh, inflammation in the nose, nostrils and all and then eyes also. They get kind of burns. Delhi's awful air is notorious, but this November appears to be the worst ever, mostly because of farmers in the north burning their fields after the harvest. That smoke creates a toxic stew of gases, which gets blown not just over the capital, New Delhi, but also to India's most visited tourist attraction, the Taj Mahal in nearby Agra. Today, crews resorted to spraying the pollution off trees near the World Heritage Site, and there was even an air purification truck driving around to suck pollutants out of the smog, though both measures smacked of desperation. The city's top engineer said the truck was being dispatched to the worst spots and he insisted it was making a difference. As a further measure, private cars are being restricted, with even in odd-numbered license plates being permitted on alternating days. But local climate policy experts cast doubt on the effectiveness of that tactic too. Of course, it's ineffective in dealing with air pollution as an, as an issue, you know. Uh, if air pollution was solely due to the vehicular traffic, then this would be a solution. Right now, it cannot be a solution because uh, motorized private transport has a very small share in the whole pie. Using farm machinery instead of burning to get rid of the crop leftovers is widely accepted as essential to solving Delhi's wintertime smog problem. The government is subsidizing some farmers to buy the new equipment, but its benefits may take years to be felt. And even then, it won't do anything about industrial pollution, which is also a huge contributor to India's dirty air. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. Yeah, it's not something new there. This happens no. pretty much every year at this uh -huh. time, largely because of that burning. Yeah, but to hear that this year in particular is about the worst ever, I mean, that's saying something there. And two, two packs of cigarettes two packs a day. Of cigarettes. Oh, that's not great, so... Nothing like that here. Absolutely it is, although not. Although it is a little murky. Yeah, yeah, we've got a little bit of murkiness going yeah. on, but certainly nothing compared to that. But I personally noticed the early sunrise today. I don't know about you. Back to the sort of like 7 o'clock mm -hmm. hour as opposed to the 8 o'clock? 8 o'clock hour? Yeah, I did I'm trying to find a positive with that. <laughs> Anyways, have a look at what it was like here, because now the sunrise happening at just shortly after 7. I believe it's about 7.15 or so. But of course, yes, as everyone was talking about today, say goodbye to that sun by quarter to five in the afternoon but fortunately there still was some sunshine we are in November this is no surprise and I wanted to really just prep you for what we can be expecting throughout this month now November is by far the rainiest month in Vancouver we get 186 millimeters of rain on average and that means that about 20 of our 30 days in the month are gonna be rainy well here we are on the fourth and we haven't had a single drop yet so we're still hanging on this is looking pretty good it has been unusually dry however we so our last bit of rain on October 25th. So that means it's been about 10 days. Now, will that trend be continuing for too, too much longer? Well, we've got about another two days here. High pressure, still well situated over the southern half of the province. That's going to be pushing its way down to Washington State. And that's going to allow this rain from the Pacific to finally make its way on shore here. This is going to be looking at the timeline of around Thursday at this point in time. If I zoom in a little bit closer here, you can see that come the afternoon hours, this will be about 4 o'clock on Thursday, we might see a few showers go across the lower mainland but then clearing up again on Friday probably a little bit more cloudy than anything else and then Saturday as much as it pains me to say that looks to be about the inaugural return of the rain shall we say across the region it's hard to say exactly how much we're going to be getting at this point in time but that is definitely going to be the day to be watching in terms of our five-day forecast one of the things you're going to notice here is that our temperatures are still very consistent normal in the city of Vancouver is 10 degrees at this point in time so when we see day time highs around 11 that's pretty where pretty well where we should be and as you're probably going to notice too the overnights no longer as chilly as they once were could still be seeing them down into the low single digits on tuesday but by the time we get into the end of the week and into the weekend well we're back into that sort of moderated cloudy showery pattern so 
That's how it goes. There must be a balance in all things. Yes, I say it be. all the time. There must be. <laughs> exactly. And the skiers and boarders, are yes. of course, are hoping for the freezing level to yes. come down. That's what I'm personally hoping for as well. <laughs> and, and the precipitation. Exactly. Right, thank you. You're welcome. Well, more than 10% of students are not vaccinated in alternative schools in Toronto. Why, that's a healthcare headache coming up. I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Join Leanne Young as she moderates the next UBC Dialogue series, Is It Time to Wave the Flag? A discussion on what needs to be done to build a more inclusive society in Canada. And get your tickets today to Corleone's moving Remembrance Day concert, Protect Us From War. Get your tickets and learn more at corleone.org. For more on these events, check us out online. CBC Toronto analysis has found more than 10% of students are unvaccinated in a dozen publicly funded schools in the city. All 12 are alternative schools and the students receive vaccination exemptions for religious or non-medical reasons. As Farah Morale tells us, health officials warn that percentage puts kids at risk for the spread of contagious diseases. Good job! At 11 months old, Scarlett Ronbeck is a healthy, happy and playful baby. But it wasn't always that way. Oh, we almost lost her a couple times. And um, yeah, it was, it was pretty rocky for a while there. At seven weeks, Scarlett developed a bad cough, then started turning blue. She was rushed to hospital where doctors diagnosed her with whooping cough just five days before she was scheduled to be vaccinated. It was kind of surreal because your mind doesn't go to a disease like that that you had thought had been eradicated decades ago. Yay! Because of what happened to her daughter, Rebecca Stonham has become an outspoken advocate for mandatory vaccines, especially school-aged kids. But CBC Toronto has found that more than 10% of kids at a dozen schools in Toronto have been exempt from vaccinations because of religious or non-medical reasons. All 12 are alternative schools. Seven of the 12 are in downtown Toronto. The school with the highest percentage of students that are unvaccinated because of those exemptions 
Da Vinci School at more than 36%. The second highest, Alpha Alternative Junior School on Brant Street with more than 22%. As a parent, does that concern you? Um, I mean, I don't, not really. Uh, like, I, I understand why people choose not to vaccinate their children. I don't know, I just think life is full of risks and I don't think it's a big issue, personally. Though the percentage might not concern those parents, public health officials say that's dangerously high. If we had a, an exemption rate of, say, 10% across all schools in Toronto, we could definitely see outbreaks of measles. And we've seen that in California, we've seen that in New York. Federal, provincial and municipal health authorities all agree vaccines are critical in preventing the spread of infectious diseases like measles. But they say misinformation on the dangers of vaccines persist. This rally held at Queen's Park was in support of a superior court challenge against mandatory vaccines. They do cause injury. Our government pretends that they don't. A lot of it is false truths, um, and they've they've understood it and take it to heart, and they've chosen not to vaccinate their children. And so that's why what we're really trying to do is to get at the 20% of parents that are hesitant. You want to play with your tractor? Meanwhile, Stonham says she'll continue telling her story in hopes of changing a few hesitant minds. It would definitely be to think about your actions um, because there's more than just your children. I can guarantee you that if any parent was in the situation that I was in, they would probably have a little bit of a different outlook on vaccines. The CBC's Farrah Morale reporting tonight from Toronto. Now, police in Ontario are investigating after a group of stunt drivers stopped traffic on a major highway. <laughs> Posted online over the weekend, a driver is seen doing donuts in the middle of the eight-lane highway. Video also shows a long line of stop traffic, as well as several onlookers recording the stunt. The incident happened near Toronto's Pearson International Airport. Well, a New Brunswick woman considers herself a bit of an energy-saving pioneer. Wendy Keats went off the grid 15 years ago, and while she admits she's made a few mistakes along the way, as Gary Moore reports, Keats says she couldn't be more happy living a life unplugged. Wendy Keats fires up her hot tub. Now, this isn't your typical plastic molded luxury. It's a custom-built cedar barrel fueled by a wood stove. It gets so hot, it's earned the name Keats Cauldron. It seats 13 people, and the best part? It doesn't make any noise. It's so nice just to sit there, listen to the fire crackling under the stars with no noise whatsoever. Nestled along the Petticodiac River near Salisbury, Keats enjoys a quiet life unplugged. But when she made the decision to cut ties with NB Power nearly 15 years ago, she was a pioneer. And she's the first to admit she made mistakes. Oh, wrong size system, not understanding how batteries work, ruined my first set of batteries, you know, just, um, you know, really not understanding, I think, and so therefore not being able to do the best job that you can with the equipment that you've got. But Keats stuck with it and is now a bit of a trailblazer for people looking to make a similar move. Oh, it's very viable now, much more, uh, I think, than it was when I went off the grid. The Keats homestead is powered by solar panels and heated by south-facing windows and a wood stove. And she has an on-demand hot water system. Yeah. Wendy continues to renovate her 2,000-square-foot home, adding a guest room and an office. But the biggest payoff? I haven't, I haven't seen an MB Power envelope arrive in my mailbox for 15 years now, so that's pretty cool. Keith says she spends about $1,200 a year for wood and propane and laughs at the thought of ever reconnecting to the grid. Gary Moore, CBC News, Salisbury. It's a traditional practice that was banned for many years. Coming up, we'll meet a BC artist who's bringing back traditional Indigenous tattooing.
Tuesday on the early edition, we'll head back to Oppenheimer Park and hear from some of the homeless camp's many Indigenous residents about who's been looking out for them. That's Tuesday on the early edition beginning at 5 a.m. on CBC Radio 1. Well, tattoos have long been part of Indigenous traditions, but while the practice was banned, now it's coming back to life. Our colleagues at CBC Arts introduce us to a BC artist who's reviving the tradition. Hello, my name is Dion Kazis. I'm Hungarian, Métis, and in Tlokmuk. I'm a cultural tattoo practitioner situated in the heart of the revival of Indigenous tattooing in Canada. I grew up in Salmon Arm, BC, which is actually outside of my traditional territory. It was challenging to grow up outside of my uh, ancestral community because I didn't have connection to the land. I didn't have connection to those cultural teachings. I just completed my master's degree and my research question was revival of indigenous tattooing. That question was, how was a sleeping tattoo tradition awakened? And so I've moved out here to Big Magi to start a position as the coordinator of Indigenous Affairs and student advising at Acadia University. The interesting thing about the revival of Indigenous tattooing is the question of why are we actually reviving something? It wasn't just lost. It was purposely destroyed, purposely taken away from us. Our identity as Indigenous people is so integrally connected to our place, to our land. So all of these are things are connected not only to the colonization of indigenous peoples, but the colonization of indigenous bodies. There is a reality for our youth that they're growing up on a world that is volatile. They're growing up on a world that wishes they weren't who they are as an indigenous person. So the importance of sharing the revival of our tattooing traditions with our youth is a way to anchor them. We always talk about our indigenous tattooing as tattoo medicine. And a lot of people think about medicine as something that you take to uh, make you feel better about something, you know? And so in a lot of ways, that is what happens. And whenever you need it, you can look down and you know that you're connected to generations of ancestors who prayed you into existence. When I finish a tattoo that is talking about uh, someone's dream, when I bring that dream to reality, it gives me a lot of joy. And I feel very honored that people trust me and entrust me with their bodies. They trust me with their dreams and their aspirations and their hopes. And so it's a very humbling experience to do those. You know, the question of identity is such an important one for us to explore. For many years, I felt off balance. So the work of the revival of Nthukmuk tattooing has uh, helped me to feel whole and make me feel stronger and firmer in my own identity as an Indigenous person and as an Nthukmuk person. And you can watch a full version of this documentary from our friends at CBC Arts on GEM. And be sure to find more incredible Canadian artists on the CBC Arts TV show called The Exhibitionists that runs every Friday at 11.30 p.m. You can always find this newscast online at cbc.ca slash bc. Dan is here at 11 right after The National. We are going to leave you now with some more shots of tonight's pigeon story. District of North Van considering a pigeon ban at council tonight. See you tomorrow.